I'll send it to her, Marie, so you can open All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as we did last night, we're going to wait a minute as we just went live for us to... Um, for us to get our viewership up. Last night we had uh, went from zero viewers to about 200 in the span of about a minute. So I uh, just want to give everybody that opportunity. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Cushing. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Schools for uh, Medford Public Schools. And so we are, um, we're happy to have you here again for another StreamYard. Uh, once again, just want to remind people, StreamYard is not like Zoom. This is kind of like a television broadcast studio uh, where we have several people who come in and out uh, during the course of the meeting. And then we are um, also uh, able to take questions when you submit them in the comment box to uh, Facebook or YouTube. These videos are saved and logged there uh, for in perpetuity. Uh, so we will be able to refer back to them as necessary or if other parents aren't able to join us, uh, there will be a um, there will be a thing. Uh, there will be issues there. So what I wanted to jump into uh, right away was yesterday, last night, uh, we shared some information that was put out by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, as well as the governor's office. And so we are um, going to share my screen here real quick. And um, hold on one second. I apologize. Uh, I just got to deal with a technical issue here. And uh, before I get into that, I also just want to introduce uh, other people in the room with me right now. Good morning, Suzanne Galusi, uh, su Assistant Superintendent of Schools for the elementary level. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Maurice Edward Vincent, Superintendent of Schools, and I look forward to continuing to get feedback from all stakeholders, parents, community, staff who are participating during this Green Yard session. And uh, we have a lot of updates for you, and we'll give you some similar information that was presented last night for those of you that weren't able to join us, just so that everyone has the same baseline information, and we will look forward to answering your questions 
um, as they come in. Thank you. Um, so, and then uh, we'll also be having our superintendent resident, uh, Tom Milichewski, uh joining us soon. Um, but we want to get started and not delay any further. So we've got our, um, we've got our, and here's Tom right now. Tom, you want to introduce yourself to the community? Yep. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time oh, to join Tom, us. You today. Muted. Oh, no, you're good. All right. Good to go. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time to join us today to share your uh, your questions, your thoughts, your comments, uh, and your feedback. Uh, I will be uh, moderating the, the chat, so I'll be doing my best to pull off some of the comments that are uh, coming from Facebook and coming from YouTube and to get as many as I can uh, out to our team. So uh, I apologize if I don't get to your question again. They, they've been coming in over the past few times we've done this very quickly. We've had a lot of participation. Uh, again, I'll do my best to uh, get to as many questions as we can. And we're going to take about an hour here. So uh, just you can kind of, uh, we'll be here till about 11 uh, and just diving into um, to some of the things that you throw our way. All right. So I want to share our share my screen with you uh, real quick uh, and uh, get you uh, to this information. So this graph was first uh, presented last week by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's put out by Johns Hopkins University. Um, and uh, you can see here uh, the 50 states and Puerto Rico, uh, one of the American territories. Uh, so you have our um, positivity levels. And if you go down the line, you see right where Massachusetts is here. Um, also wanna then move to the map that the governor's office re released yesterday for the 14 days between 722 and August 5th. Um, and you'll see the various color codings. Uh, red is greater than eight cases per 100,000. Um, so you can see where those communities are. Yellow, uh, four to eight cases per 100,000. Green is fewer than uh, four cases per 100,000. Uh, and then uh, the white communities are fewer than five cases reported in total, not per 100,000, fewer than five cases reported in total. Um, so that was provided by the governor's office yesterday. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education released this color-coded metric with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education expectation for learning model. Uh, so right there, you can have uh, that for reference that was put out by the commissioner last night and is on the DESE website. Um, so red is expected uh, remote. Yellow is expected hybrid or remote. Um, if extenuating circumstances. Uh, and then green, which is where Medford is, green and white, unshaded, uh, is considered full-time in-person or hybrid. Uh, and then here are the specific numbers for Medford, uh, 722 through 85 that are published on the state website. And you just go to mass.gov, uh, and then there's a tab for COVID, and I will link that to our Facebook page at the end of today's uh, session. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing right now and head back into the stream yard. Um, so I know that um, we will be uh, taking questions now. I also wanted to address our frequently asked questions. We will be producing those answers in an executive summary format by tomorrow night at five o'clock. Uh, we have teams of people working on them. We received almost 100 pages of questions. And so uh, to sort through all of that, there are many similar uh, questions. Um, we are um, sorting through them to provide executive summary answers to best address everybody's questions. So uh, we're ready to take your questions at this time. All right, uh, so I understand the survey is not binding. When will we have to officially select hybrid or remote for our children? I also believe we have to put in a formal request in during the first semester if we want to make a change. How likely do you think that is possible? All right, that's a great question, Bill. So I, I wanna start by saying that um, the draft dynamic plan is being updated based on community input um, 
educator and administrative input as well as DESI input. So they've reached out to communities and districts um, to give us feedback on our plan as well. So we're in the middle of finalizing um, all of that so that we can submit it by the end of the week. Uh, the, new, the new deadline for, the, for DESI for finalization is this Friday. In that updated plan, which uh, the community will see probably Friday, um, we have put in for uh, some movement within plans. So, or excuse me, learning models. So we understand that it may not be a fit for students if they started in hybrid um, or if they started in remote and wanted to move to a different learning model. We also know that situations may arise in families where you need to switch models. So we have put some language in the updated dynamic plan to reflect that. So basically a family would put a request in um, and we will look at the logistics of it. And the request needs to come in about, we're, we're gonna go by the semesters, the marking periods. So another piece is that, you know, DESI is requiring that all grading is in place and continues. So the typical grading systems and report cards will start day one. So that kind of lends itself to natural semesters. So that's how we're going to be switching um, and taking parent requests at that time. So about two weeks before the close of a semester, parents can formally request if they would like their child to have a learning model switch. So at the elementary level where there are three report cards and a winter break, their date for that first semester is uh, Friday, December 11th, that they would have to put the request in. That gives administration and school buildings the time to work on the logistics um, so that it could go into effect coming back in January. At the secondary level, uh, two weeks prior to the first semester close is Monday, November 2nd. And then the, that would go into effect when the new semester starts, which would begin uh, Monday, November 16th. All of this is contingent upon uh, capacity. So we have to look at numbers and we have to look at balance. We also want it to be noted that if a parent is putting in a request uh, for a learning model change, uh, that it may include a change in teacher as well as classmates because those models are not set up to share um, classmates or educators. All right, so uh, all right, so our, our next question, um, we heard um, last we heard night, a lot of these questions today. last night and um, also today. Is Lady, um, the question is from Lanny, when do you discuss this contract? Uh, so contract. Some of our team uh, can uh, share uh, a little bit of uh, uh, maybe an update of where we are, maybe an update of where we are, or not, something that we're not going to be able to share something else yet. So we, we are currently uh, still in the process of impact bargaining. So we have proposed some dates. We're waiting for confirmation. So the district lawyer and the MTA union representative, they are coordinating schedules to get those dates down. But we did propose three dates. There were some conflicts. So we are working, uh, waiting to get what the new proposed dates are going to be but ongoing negotiations will continue to take place between now and the start of school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just stay muted because you can use this. Go ahead. Uh, our, our next one uh, from Patricia. I understand that the hybrid plan allows for stage reopening slash return. What specific metrics are being used to determine that the next stage group can return to in-person instruction? Uh, I know in the graphic that we share with school committee on um, on Monday night, it outlined some of the specific dates, potential dates of the phases, uh, and also had a box to the side that said that that was contingent upon certain uh, metrics being used. So I don't know if someone on the team could just maybe speak about some of those metrics that are going to be used as we try to determine whether or not we can move in between the phases. So that's exactly right. Um, the, the phases right now go for every two weeks um, to, to bring in a new group. 
So using the metrics that were supplied to us yesterday by the governor and uh, Commissioner Riley from the Department of Education, uh, in collaboration with Medford's Board of Health, will help keep us aligned with our staggered approach. So if the metrics are, if we're, if the Medford community is still in the unshaded or green uh, color code, then we are able to keep proceeding with our staggered approach. Our, our next question, uh, how many close, from Allison, how many close contacts do you expect students and teachers to have at each grade level? Uh, so maybe this is a chance for us also to talk about some of the ways that we're trying to maintain social distancing uh, throughout our buildings when our students come back in, and also a chance for us to talk about school-based teams and some of the work that they'll be doing to maps out some of these logistics. Yeah, so the school-based teams are going to be working to uh, put up signage, to have um, signage on the floors, um, spray painting markers at the exterior of the building at six feet, and all those types of things. And so um, we are we are really committed to limiting the number of students in the buildings uh, to maximize the uh, to actually to minimize the close contacts. So close contact is very specifically defined by within six feet without a mask for X period of time. And so that's all detailed uh, in the dynamic reopening plan uh, starting on pages. Uh, 41 uh, with general health guidelines 41 I also noticed uh, people talking about you know if a, if a if a student gets sent home does a whole class get sent home and that is not the case um, so just please be sure to read through um, starting on page 41 unfortunately Tony Ray our nurse director wasn't able to be here today because of other meetings and commitments but we will have her on again uh, in the near future for another uh, event uh, so that she can help answer all those questions specifically. But we have a very, very detailed plan that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education actually praised in a phone call the other day because of its level of detail around these informations um, so that, um, you know, we will be doing that. I also noticed another question. I know Tom didn't put it up, but people were asking about a student who might have a legitimate medical reason why they can't wear a mask. Now, we have purchased about a thousand desktop uh, screens. This is not one of the ones we've purchased. This is a free sample that someone sent, uh, but it'll give you a sense of um, the sense. Ours are 100% clear all around, all right? And they'll go on top of the desktops. And so they're made up of a stronger or firm material. So for students who aren't able um, to, for students who aren't able to wear a mask for legitimate um, IEP or medically documented issues, that is definitely something that we will be um, working with. So. So our next question comes from uh, Muzzy Lim. Uh, if we choose hybrid and part uh, way through the semester, the schools are forced to go all remote. Will the class continue to be taught using the hybrid schedule or the to a remote schedule? So obviously, a circumstance we don't obviously don't want to happen, but we're certainly planning for uh, the possibility of that happening. So know someone on the team can speak about what does that transition look like in the case that we do have to go full remote for everyone. Sure, because the schedules will be created um, for students based on the learning model that they choose. So students that are in the hybrid model, whether you're an elementary or secondary level, a schedule is created for you. If we are forced to close partway through at any time, we will stay in the hybrid model the, so that the teachers are the same because the students have already started working with them and a rapport has been set. Depending on the length of the closure, the hybrid um, teachers will remain the same, but the schedule may shift so that you're not, it's not going to be that your students are receiving two and a half days of virtual instruction and two full days of asynchronous. It would mirror a little bit the remote uh, overall schedule um that those details are being worked out with the school-based teams right now so our, our next question from jessica and we um 
Are all children with an IEP considered high needs? When will a parent be notified if their child has been identified as a high needs? And does that mean they will return to a hybrid platform on day one at school? So I think we use the term high needs a lot in some of these presentations. Uh, so I think it's important for us to maybe clarify what exactly uh, may be categorized as high needs in this circumstance, and particularly address whether or not all students on IEPs are considered high needs. So I'll turn over to Ms. Galusi who can yep. uh, address that. So Joan Bowen, the director of um, Pupil Services, has been working around the clock all summer uh, with many of us to ensure that student needs are taken care of and well fought in terms of scheduling and their IEP needs. So IEP needs in a remote situation, uh, remote learning plans are created in that case so that student needs are taken into account both in person and virtually, depending on what learning um, model families choose. High needs, as Dr. Edouard Vincent has said many times, includes five protected classes of students. If we're specifically talking about students um, on an IEP, the high needs are for students where about about 75 percent of their IEP academic needs encompass the school day. So in other words, um, if during a typical school day, your child has IEP services that equal about 75 percent of their day, then they are qualified as high needs. So what Joan Bowen is working on with her staff diligently is is coming up with groupings for students. And I would anticipate that you would be hearing something um, probably in September at some point. Uh, our, right now, our official first day of school is Wednesday, September 16th. And so what the school-based teams are working on right now uh, are the schedules and the cohorts and all the fine details that we will be able to share with families in September. And so I, I just want to piggyback and say that uh, your first question explicitly, are all children with an IEP considered high needs? The answer to that question is no. That all children are an IEP, yes, they are receiving additional services, but do they qualify uh, for receiving that 70 to 75 percent of the day where they have targeted uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapies, other related service providers that are working with their students, um, those would be the students that are specifically classified. And um, Ms. Joan Bowen and her team, they are reaching out to families, um, but that's still, that's still in the works right now. But every single student on an IEP would not be classified in that grouping, just, just to provide clarification. So you'll hear directly from Ms. Bowen. So our next question relates to masks. Uh, this comes from Dana. What is the recommended protocol that ensures safety and health for all students and staff? If a student is prompted to put on a mask and they refuse, what if a student can't use a mask due to medical needs? Will there be individual plans for each student who falls into this category? I'm gonna turn it over to some of the team. I just wanna share one thing. There was a lot of questions last night about whether or not masks were mandatory. I just wanted to emphasize that masks were mandatory for all grade levels. Um, so that's, that's the given here. Uh, then I think your question gets at sort of how do we enforce that, right? And then also how do we accommodate for students who uh, can't use a mask due to medical needs? So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Cushing to give that level of detail. So um, there are def we've detailed in our plan uh, the specifics on masks um, quite extensively. Uh, we've added graphics on how students should be wearing them um, and all those types of things. Um, and so quite simply, if a student uh, does not put on a mask and refuses, uh, the student will be transferred to the remote learning plan. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a public health crisis and we need to do everything possible to keep as many students and as many teachers um, as safe as possible. And we want to make sure that uh, parents understand that they, ha you have the option for the remote learning. Uh, if you have a personal belief or bias against mask wearing, despite it being proven to have really helped to, uh, to get Massachusetts where it is, um, the three big things are wearing a mask, which you can buy at bcmasks.com for your Medford branding. Number two, all right, physical distancing. And number three, 
frequent hand washing slash hand sanitization. Um, so, you know, uh, if a student refuses, then unfortunately they will be, um, uh, they will be part of the remote learning plan. Uh, we need our staff and students to be safe. Um, so, and those students with medical needs, uh, I addressed this a little bit ago, Dana, but just in case you didn't see it, your question may have been, um, we will be providing these desk shields for students as well as having them maintain that six feet of distance. Uh, so, you know, that is, that is where we are with that. And so on page, yep, page 13, uh, we have the, uh, we have the masks, uh, quite, here you go. Uh, sorry, page 14. We have our masks right there. And then, uh, the full color, the full color does it more justice. And then, uh, we've got a student mask right there. We tried to go really heavy on the graphics. Um, so boom. All right, so our next question uh, relates to uh, computer usage. Will the district issue Chromebooks formatted in a way to personalize the user? The school Chromebook that we borrowed in the spring consistently logged off the internet, would not allow passwords slash websites to be saved, and would not allow Zoom to be downloaded. I have had to set up, um, log in my first grader multiple times a day, so she gets the content she needed. Um, I'd also like our team and this to, uh, to address uh, just some of the consistency that we're striving for and maybe some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from, you know, our taking on remote in the spring and now how that may look different here in the fall. Uh, exactly right, Tom. So we heard this uh, concern a lot when we asked for feedback um, from families in the community based on how last year's remote experience was. And so that consistency piece and also having students um, create a little bit more ease for access on a lot of the educational platforms and websites that they need to go on. Um, the district is now going to utilize a system called Clever. It is detailed in our dynamic plan, and we've even included a link so that if you would like to find out a little bit more about the Clever platform, you can just click that link. Um, it'll bring you. But what Clever is, is a single stream platform. So using the, the, every student is issued an email address. And when the students use their Metro Public Schools email address, they just log on to Clever once. And then all of the educational platforms that Metro Public Schools will be using at every level will be housed in Clever. And so all students will need to do is click um, on the icon that they need. And so it, it takes away having to keep and manage all of the individual uh, logons and passwords. So our next question from uh, Allison, have you considered creating a brief questionnaire, uh, a smartphone web-based for a daily health check and upon arrival for each student slash staff? Many workplaces have implemented this already and it discourages people from hiding symptoms. Uh, I'll turn over to some of the team, the chapters. I also wanna share, this is something that our uh, ESY team did uh, and ask families to complete just a, a quick questionnaire uh, before they sent their students to uh, ESY for a way for them just to monitor their students and make sure they were coming in uh, healthy. Uh, so that's certainly something that has been tried here in the district throughout the summer. I'll turn over to someone from the team who can share maybe what that might look like uh, possibly in the fall. And if we don't have the answer, maybe just a good idea for us to consider as well. So um, we actually have a, a really good answer on that. So. Um, we are going to be working with a company called AlphaMed, and what's really awesome is that uh, these types of um, these types of services is, is driving some profitability for some companies during this COVID crisis. And so these apps usually have a per user fee that Medford would be paying around thirty thousand um, dollars to use this app for the school year. Now, because we have a connection, um, we have an app. It's called Alpha Med, um, and because of a Medford uh, connection, we are able to do this for free, which is really awesome. Um, so we'll be pushing that out. It's really phenomenal that we're gonna have this app. Um, so visitors to the building will be expected to use it. All these types of things um, are really, really important. 
um, that we are going to have this so that people can do it. Now, we need people to be honest. Like, let's be honest here. Uh, we are a community now more than ever, all right? And we cannot be selfish and put others in jeopardy. And, you know, we have to be very careful with how we travel. We have to be very careful with how we do things um, for the greater good. Uh, and so that's so critically important. Look, wearing a mask isn't comfortable, all right? But we need to do it. And we need to be very careful with who we associate with and our circle of friends right now. And I hate the uh, I hate the concept of this new normal. I hope it's the temporary normal. All right, all right. I really do. I hope it's not the new normal. I hope it's the temporary normal, so that we can get back to uh, the society that we want to be. Um, so just wanted to say that we have that, and we, we need people to be honest and upfront and working with us. And, and I think you just know that we are working on um, language to inform parents uh, regarding Alphamed and how it will be utilized um, as part of the daily correspondence with schools. All right. Great. Uh, so I, I'm not able to pull, I can't find the question on here. It looks like it disappeared with a great question. So I'm going to, I'm going to raise a uh, show of comments that was related. It was from Jamie Lee who actually helped answer a question for us about sibling preferences. The other, the other question is asking how will the cohort be developed? This was from a parent child with multiple grades, two, six, and I believe. And will still sibling preferences be taken into account? I also think that this is a change for us to even talk about uh, question related learning pods and some families will ask, can they uh, possibly make their own pods? So just want to maybe we can talk through the process of how are we going to develop our cohorts and especially, you know, taking sibling preference. So I, I want to start by just saying that sibling preference and working with families is critically um, important. So once we get the surveys uh, in, and we were just this morning, we were almost at 2,000 surveys within two days. So um, uh, parent response has been phenomenal. We're going to continue to send reminders out. But um, we need parents to fill out that survey in order for us to have an idea of what the numbers are. The one uh, constraint it's where cohorts are concerned, where families have children in more than one building. Um, we want to be able to uh, have families have their children participating in the hybrid model on the same day so that as a family unit, to the extent possible, you're having all of your children, whether you have one at the elementary, one at the middle and one at the high, if hybrid is your selected model, um, they would be participating in the same cohort grouping. The cohorts, to the extent possible, it's going, once we have the final data from the survey, um, we will start looking at the cohorts. There have been a lot of questions. As we set up the cohorts for the hybrid instruction, we need to try to balance the classrooms. So, for example, if there are 22 students in a classroom, we wouldn't be able to have a cohort, Monday, Tuesday cohort, cohort B, have 19 students and only end up with two students in cohort C on the Thursday, Friday cohort. So that is something that we have to try to take into consideration. So I know that there have been a lot of um, questions and asks as community and family are trying to figure out um, how to manage groupings. So we are definitely gonna, once all the data is in and it goes to the school-based teams, they're gonna look at the cohorts, they're gonna look at families, um, trying to ensure that children are able, uh, siblings are able to go to school on the same days. And then once we have that information, trying to balance the cohorts as much as possible. It might not be exactly 50-50, you know, it might be 45-55 or 40-60, but we really need to keep the groups balanced to the extent possible so that um, the teachers have balanced groups of students and we're limiting, we're limiting the amount of students that are in a classroom 
honoring the six feet of space. So I do want to say that because it's possible once all the data comes in that we could end up again with 19 or 20 students, uh, families selecting the same exact cohort and two on the other day. So again, we won't have um, that final information until the surveys are completed and it goes to the school-based teams and we look at balancing the numbers. So I do ask for a little patience, but completing that survey for us will really help us to start moving forward with the next phase. Thank you. All right, Ms. Randall. Um, so, right. Uh, so Ms. Randall, one of our great science teachers, um, so the HVAC system will be evaluated next week. Um, so as soon as we get the report, we'll be sharing that out. I mean, you know, the, the issues need to be addressed. Um, and um, we've actually added uh, later in the document, you'll see coming out from a Harvard University publication, uh, Dr. Joseph Allen does a lot of work on this. So we've added a graphic, uh, it's a triangular shaped graphic um, that has been added to the dynamic planning framework. Uh, it's in the draft right now that is not published uh, for our second run. Uh, Patty, I have no problem uh, emailing that to you uh, later today, that graphic so that you can see it. But we will be sharing out the, hold on one second, I think we might be getting back feed again. Mr. Milchewski, can you mute your mic? That work? All right, perfect. So um, we really want to make sure that that uh, HVAC information is clearly published to the community. Uh, we will have three engineers at the high school next week. Um, I also saw Andrea mentioning, um, I think Andrea uh, also mentioned related to this. I am curious to hear about individual classrooms being evaluated. Uh, so we do have crews working on that. Even in the new buildings, there are individual classrooms where the ventilation isn't reliable. Uh, Arctic Engineering and our own team of um, maintenance crew uh, have been um, there working on the outside buildings, replacing the belts, pulleys, drive shafts, motors as needed um, to make sure that those buildings are fully up and running. Last year, several of the buildings, I'm just, last summer was my first summer here. Uh, there was substantial work done on the HVAC systems last summer uh, for various issues. So, um, you know, those buildings have been really focused on and well maintained. We do have work to do at the high school and the report from WB Engineering, that's the company that we are working with. Uh, that report um, is gonna be part of a comprehensive plan to make sure that we're providing a safe space. And Ms. Brando, just real quick, you know, I mean, your science labs are where we want the rest of the facility to be, for sure. Um, so, all right. So our next question from Jennifer, uh, logistical question around uh, remote and hybrid, and just how we're gonna be able to pull that off. You've said that all levels of classes will be offered remote and hybrid, how is that possible? There are classes that usually only run as one section. Are those classes getting split up or are teachers going to be teaching remote and hybrid? So didn't know if someone from our team can talk just a little bit about how we are uh, planning, especially last year there was a question about AP and honors classes. Will those both be offered, you know, remote and hybrid or do families have to select one particular track to access those classes? Uh, so I don't know if someone in our team can talk about just uh, how, what types of classes we're planning on offering and do families have to select a certain track to be able to access those uh, particular classes? Uh, that's a great question, but what our intention right now Hold on, you're gonna have to start over. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Was, I, I'm trying was... to. We're tr sorry, guys. We're trying to manage the feedback, so we apologize. Uh, we don't want the uh, we don't want the uh, feedback. 
to really be uh, causing an issue. Uh, so we apologize. We're trying to manage our microphones here. So thank you um, for the audio comments because that triggered us to not to. So. Okay. Unfortunately, Ms. Galusi needs to start over. <laughs> I was rolling. Um, so we want parents to select the learning plan that works for their family and for their children. So it is the intent that Medford Public educators will teach either the hybrid learning model or the remote learning model. How those teachers will be selected is a, a decision that needs to be made in collaboration with the Teachers Association. And so we don't have those answers yet. Um, in terms of high school level courses, uh, the specifics of the scheduling, I'm sorry, we don't have more details just yet, but the, the, the details of the scheduling is what the school-based teams are working on right now. And those school-based teams were the second part of this planning phase. And so we had to wait until the school committee decision, which was just last Thursday. So this is the first week um, that the school-based teams are getting up and running. So once we have the specifics on scheduling, we will let the community know. So our uh, next question, while we try to get it up on the screen here, uh, is about just transitions. Uh, so I'm trying to find the question here from Erica. It says, there is a transitional year for freshmen. Will there be orientation for ninth graders who will be remote until October 26th? Uh, and also, maybe this is an opportunity for a similar team to chime in for on just what are we looking at during those initial orientations for students, uh, particularly thinking about those students who may be going into a remote model to give them the chance to meet their teacher and to meet their peers. So we're not only going to be looking at orientations for our ninth graders, we're going to be orientations for our, um, we're going to be looking at orientations and trainings for our parents as well. Um, so setting up um, sessions for parents to be able to watch, learn, um, to do it both live and on video at their own leisure. Um, so we'll be working on putting together a slate of classes um, for them, but we will definitely be having an orientation for not only our rising ninth graders, but our rising sixth graders and others as we need um, and see fit. Also last night we had a great suggestion to have um, StreamYards, this, uh, this app, to be used with our elementary, middle, and high school leadership. Uh, so uh, I had said last night that we would probably set that up for next week. In all honesty, just given uh, we have a tremendous amount of professional development going on next week, uh, we will more than likely have to do that the following week, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we don't want to put it off. It's just when we actually sat down and looked at the calendar, um, but we do want to make sure that we are providing uh, you guys as much information as possible, as quickly as possible, and, um, you know, just being part of this process that, as I said last night, it feels like, uh, you know, Medford used to build clipper ships uh, in the Mystic River. Uh, it feels like we're sailing a ship without a star or a map sometimes, and we're really trying to figure it out as we go. So, um, but... And I know there was a question that was about kindergarten orientation, so maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's overall in our timeline, which is reflected in the dynamic plan. Um, the commissioner gave every district in the Commonwealth 10 days so that staff have time to plan, work, collaborate, um, be professionally developed, as well as families um, at, that Dr. Cushing mentioned. But within those 10 days, we have airmarked three of them for orientation purposes at every level. So regardless if your family has chosen the hybrid learning model or the remote learning model, uh, we are going to use those three days to create uh, safe, socially distant opportunities, possibly outdoors, um, for families. So parents and caregivers, as well as children, to meet their educators. Even if you're going remote, we feel it is extremely important for you to be able to meet in person and start to build that rapport um, so that you can you can know someone um, more than just the, the pixelated uh, boxes on the computer screen. So we will send out, you will probably 
be hearing from the building based teams on your schedule for the orientation days. So the next question that we're going to post uh, is uh, from Mitt from Mom. Uh, says, is there any update on the bus service for kids staying two miles and beyond? So I also know that uh, that was a question that was asked on the survey, was just uh, you know asking for how transportation preferences are for families, but also didn't know if someone can chime in on sort of what are the uh, boundaries that we're setting on you know who can access the transportation and what that looks like. That comment was at ten forty one. Um, can you mute your mic? All right. So, um, until we have a comprehensive understanding of the number of families looking to, um, come into the buildings by a hybrid, um, what we need to do, what we need to do is we need to really stick with the two miles. Um, the two miles is a really, uh, so our bus capacity has been reduced by 68%. We can increase that a little bit by having our um, by having students uh, who have brothers and sisters sit in the same seat together. But unfortunately, um, we we have we just don't have the buses nor the bus drivers. All right. So for those of you who don't know, there's a bus and van driver shortage in the state. Um, so it is extraordinarily difficult for us to um, get drivers in a normal situation. Um, and so there was, there was that issue as well. Um, so um, the buses, let me just give you a quick hit on bus cleaning. The buses will be sanitized in between runs. MBTA buses, I spent about a half an hour speaking to a supervisor at the MBTA. They have no equipment to add for additional um, they have no extra equipment to add additional runs. So the runs that we have will be the runs that we have on the MBTA. Um, those buses will be sanitized and cleaned before the runs and they will be sanitized midday as well. Um, so, um, by, by having a hybrid model, uh, we will naturally cut down the number of students riding those buses. Um, but the MBTA is not adding any extra equipment for for any public schools, from what I was told. Um, the other thing, too, I know we're going to move on to the next question here, um, but we are going to be um, we're going to be uh, working with Walk Medford, and our principals are setting up meetings with our um, with uh, a state representative who can help us organize walking school buses, who can help us organize students walking to school with parent volunteers um, and safely entering students to building and then walking them home. Um, so um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we know it's a challenge that really has no good answer. Okay, do you, oh, hmm. do you want me to yep. go back to We can go to Megan's question. question. You can answer it. Okay. So just to briefly answer um, Megan's question, some of those decisions um, have somewhat been made for us through the Department of Education. So they released some standards regarding uh, specialists or fine arts classes. So in particular, as of right now, music classes cannot occur indoors. So that means either we need to look at having those classes outdoors during in-person hybrid days, or most likely a lot of music education will take place virtually for students. Uh, the physical education requirements, um, they have given a different set of requirements when you're outdoors. So for example, if you have your students engaged in a physical education class and you can keep the students uh, six feet or more, if you can keep the students at 10 feet, uh, masks do not need to be worn, and those could be opportunities for mask breaks for students. But if students are six feet or closer, of course, masks have to be worn even during a physical education class. Um, in terms, the other guidance from the Department of Education says to try and keep the cohorts with as less movement as possible. 
So what that might mean at the elementary level is that the students remain in the classroom and those specialist teachers rotate into the classrooms. And at the secondary level, it, it just means that they're trying to um, cluster them so that there's not movement, too much movement. Um, but we're also looking at having some of those classes be done virtually. I, I also wanted to jump in to say um, where specials are concerned, um, one of the things that we're thinking about with the mixing of cohorts, if I were to use elementary schools as an example, um, where students may have art and they have phys ed and where the elementary school calendar, they have three, three terms, trimesters, that it may be possible to reduce the amount of interaction with different cohorts um, one thing we're looking at, again, this is going to be determined on the school-based teams level, is that it may be for a trimester, instead of going to five different specials, a student may have two specials or three specials that repeat during that trimester. And then um, that reduces the mixing of cohorts. And so, you know, from September to you know, uh, early December, it could be, you know, phys ed and art, but these particular grades have phys ed and art. And then when the next term starts, it could be different specials. So that again, we limit the amount of mixing of cohorts, if in fact that is possible. So um, a lot of this information, we're kind of on standby. As the data is coming in from the parent surveys and we end up having, um, hard numbers of what the interest is mm -hmm. and what uh, scheduling and planning we need to provide for um, our students. So I do wanna say that we have thought about that and at the school-based teams levels, depending on the setup of the school and what could be available, that that is something that um, would reduce mixing of cohorts and keep groups of students together for a longer period of time. Good. All right. Um, so uh, we want to add to the stream uh, Ms. Shulman, uh, who's our um, director of... Oh, we lost Ms. Shulman. <laughs> I, I, I actually wanted to show you... Um, this question came up earlier about our students with uh, disabilities or students who are unable to stay with a mask. This is the... It's, it's clear all the way through, but if you can see, um, I'm putting it on the table, and um, for some of you, it might not even look like I'm behind something, but this is what we have purchased for our students um, that have the need to be behind a protective shield, but they can see. And so it has four sides, uh, one, two, three, and four. And so again, it's, will sit on their desk or on their table and they'll be able to be behind the shield. So if they're talking for students who, who you know, may have a particular need, we have purchased these for um, students that have a specific need to use this um, in the classroom environment. So we are really trying to be proactive and we are really trying to think um, about all of the challenges that some of our students may have whether it's a medical requirement to keep not only the students safe, but the staff safe as well. So I just wanted to show you um, that other artifact as an example for you to know that we are trying. Um, will those desk shields be able to fit on the smaller high school desk? So this size desk shield, um, I am, I, I would say if this particular one does not fit on the desk, then for that student or the students that would need, we would be able to, trip because we're only gonna have 50% uh, capacity in a classroom that if we needed to move desks around, if we needed to move them around, then we could do that. The other thing too, Dana, I don't know how well you can see it, but this uh, model flexes um, at four points. So, you can actually you could actually put it on a desk and it's locked in at the bottom right now but sorry uh yeah. we would be able to actually wrap this around the desk and cut it as necessary um so 
this model allows us a tremendous, as it attacks me, uh, this model allows us a tremendous amount of flexibility um, for us to be able to modify to some of those smaller desks. The other option that we have is by pulling desks out of some of our middle and elementary schools, we can bring those um, up to the high school as necessary. So great question. You will have those options. So, um, so let's try to get uh, Ms. Shulman in. All right. Ms. Shulman, thanks so much for joining us. Um, just wanted to, uh, I know that you were just working on our racial equity task force, um, but I wanted to see if you had anything to add um, from your perspective. I'm, just, I'm here just to answer questions that, um, you know, parents, students, or the community have, if I could be helpful related to counseling services or behavioral health. We can't hear you. Can't hear me. Oh, no, we're good. Now we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I said I'm happy to answer any questions parents, students, teachers have, caregivers related to counseling services or behavioral health of students as we're gearing up for the new school year. Yep. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Vicki, I see a question about the N95 mask. It's possible that students who won't wear a mask have behavioral challenges and they won't like to remain seated. Will teachers working with those special populations receive N95 masks? Uh, we can definitely work for that. Um, we have a lot of N9, we have KN95 masks uh, really available to us. Um, and, we, and we also have ordered for all teachers face shields. Um, I'm gonna try to bring up a picture here um, of one of our teachers. So if you'll just give me a second. Uh, to find it and share my screen. Uh, we'll have another question pulled up while I try to find it. Um, uh, let me just find a question here so that someone else can answer. Um, oh, is there a plan in place for COVID testing? So yeah, I can speak to COVID testing. So COVID testing, we're working closely with the Medford Department Board of Health. Um, for Medford Public Schools, for Medford Public Schools staff, COVID testing will be available uh, every two weeks. So um, Mayor Lungo Kern, the Board of Health, in collaboration with Tufts University, uh, will be conducting COVID testing for Medford staff on a bi-weekly basis. Um, for staff that have already reported to work, uh, we will be able to start beginning testing the week of August 24th. We are working, we are working on getting uh, information back, uh, specifying that. But once the school year is in session, all staff in Medford Public Schools teachers, paras, everyone who works for Medford Public Schools, COVID testing will be available on a bi-weekly basis. Um, so people can continue to get tested free of charge to them. Um, they will be able to continue to get tested throughout the year to ensure their safety. Medford will also be having additional sites that is continued to be, we're working in collaboration with the Board of Health to figure out where the testing sites for the community and students will be during the school year. So um, that is something that will be uh, a, a separate uh, ask, but it's part of the plan. We're working collaboratively, but for Medford Public Schools staff, um, testing, COVID testing will be available for all staff on a biweekly basis. All right. Awesome. So I want to get back to that uh, question about the uh, about students and then Sarah Hyman Witherell. Um, you know, you've got a question as well. So um, what I'm going to do is just quickly share my screen. Um, give me a second here while I uh, move. So here's a high school teacher uh, by the name of Carla Andre, Miss Andre. Um, so she worked with us this summer. Thank you to uh, Tanya Sullivan for sending in this picture. Um, so we've got the signage up on the doors. Uh, this is on page 44. Uh, this is not just, so you know, this is in the draft plan, um, that is being worked on. So this is not published yet. The original draft is still published. 
Um, but we've added uh, the picture here and we are, um, you know, this, this face shield that you see here will be issued to all staff. Now, additional PPE right here, you can see additional PPE will be provided to direct service providers in accordance with their role and job respo responsibilities as modeled by Ms. Andre. So um, I don't know if you're on the call, uh, Ms. Andre, but thanks for being in our, in our modeling session and really appreciate uh, that help. I do wanna scroll down here just so that uh, if I can find it quickly, um, what I said to Ms. Brandle. Um, so that's the graphic that I was mentioning, Patty Brandle, if you, uh, I will send you that later on today, all right? So, but you see ventilate with outdoor air, increase filter efficiency, and there's a flow chart uh, effect to this and supplement with portable air cleaners. So that's all stuff that our engineering firm, WB Engineering, uh, is going to be able to help us make those determinations on. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and go back to the stream yard. So I wanna take one more question if we can. Um, and so, um, what about, um, kindergarten screening? No. Uh, the kindergarten screener, there was something about kindergarten screening for EL students. I was not able to get Paul Textera on the call today, this morning. However, um, for our EL students, our newcomers and our ELs are part of the five groups of students that are required to be receiving instruction um, our students with um, high needs, uh, our EL students, newcomers, uh, Desi's going to be sending out that uh, official guidance. So a, a group of our ELs specific, our homeless students, our students that are in foster care and early childhood students were the five groups that Desi asked for um, to be considered as part of the high needs group that schools will work at educating those students uh, in a full-time capacity. So I just want to uh, address that. Again, I wasn't able to have Mr. Textera uh, on live with us today, but there will be additional guidance coming forward. And as we get that guidance, we will definitely pass that on to all teachers and families so everyone knows who's uh, impacted by those groups. But I can't stress it enough for those of you who are online today, uh, if you haven't done the survey yet, please do the survey so that it can help us better prepare because the school-based teams have just kicked off and we need that data to be able to answer some of these questions. Um, so I we're thank you in half, advance for your uh, We're at about support. half the district. Half reporting. the district right now, yes. Yep. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I really wanna say thank you very much. Um, you know, this is, like I said earlier, you know, sailing a ship without a star or a map. Um, so thank you for your patience, your understanding. Um, you know, I'm sorry that we don't get to every single question, um, but you know, even if this were a Zoom, we wouldn't get to every single question. Um, and we're we're hoping that our uh, frequently asked uh, frequently asked questions document tomorrow will provide some help. It's a hundred pages of questions, so. We, we have to try to answer them in an executive summary answer as best as possible. Um, and so I have two people to call today um, based on the conversations today. Um, so Ms. Anderson and Ms. Zotter, I'll be giving you a call. Um, and I really appreciate the support of Medford. As I said earlier, we need our community to come together. We need to put any selfish interests of, you know, traveling as we're approaching school we really need to put travel plans on hold and if you do then you need to hold out for the 14 days our staff our teachers there's a moral imperative to the work that they're doing to support our students and to help them for their future you know and it, their their lives we we need you to be strong and enforce the mask wearing, enforce the physical distancing, and enforce good hand washing uh, frequently to keep everyone as safe as possible. Um, so 
Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. I'm going to give it to our superintendent for final words and then Ms. Galusi as well. I want to say thank you to everyone who jumped on the call. Thank you for the comments. We're going to continue to go through those comments. Uh, thank you for the feedback. I feel the outpouring of support from Medford has been phenomenal. Um, it was noted even by Desi, the amount of community involvement, community stakeholder, community feedback, your feedback is important to us. And again, even though the proposed plan that we put forward, the staggered hybrid, the hybrid schedule was developed by the hybrid team. The remote schedule was uh, developed by the collaborative remote team and um, the communications work group, the steering work group, all of the feedback that was given, everything was taken into consideration. And we are now um, finalizing our document where Dr. Cushing just showed you the screenshot of what some teachers will wear. I was able to show you a sample of what the actual screens look like to protect our students. We have sanitizer, we have electrostatic sprayers, we, you name it, we have it. If someone tells us about it and it's a great idea, we wanna take the good advice, throw out the bad advice. Um, we wanna keep our schools open, safe for both students and families. We wanna help all those families out there that are saying they need help, they need coverage. The majority of people thus far are, are saying they want the hybrid, but we're, we're almost at the 50% cutoff so encourage your neighbors, encourage your friends to turn that survey in. And um, once we get that information, that information will be made public. So you can also see what, um, you know, the, the, the pieces of it that say what our community is saying they actually need. So your safety, your health, your health and safety, providing a consistent educational experience for our students whether it's remote learning or whether it's hybrid learning. We want to provide a consistent experience because the feedback you gave us from the spring, we knew there was room for improvement. And I feel that what we're offering is significantly improved. So Dr. Cushing uh, just ran and got the electrostatic sprayers. And again, um, safety, masks, sanitizing, cleaning, social distancing, signs, stickers, and tape is gonna be on the floor, arrows. The school-based teams will be determining, use this stairwell to go up, that stairwell to go down. There will be bathroom schedules set up. Um, we're gonna try to do everything in our power possible to get schools up and running uh, so that everyone is safe. COVID testing for staff, um, that was like the, icing on the cake. We were so excited to get that news yesterday, caught off the press. And so we're gonna continue. As soon as we get the information, we're gonna pump that information out to you. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the feedback. It's truly appreciated. And we look forward to continuing these conversations and hearing your feedback so that Medford Public Schools can be even greater. Ms. Lucy? Yes, thank you. Uh in closing, I just want to echo what uh, Dr. Edward Vincent said that, you know, the continued partnership with you is essential moving forward. And so everyone on this call here today, um, Tom, Peter, Maurice, myself, we're all parents as well. So we feel, you know, the same things that you're feeling right now and having to make decisions for our own children about next year, too. And I think it's just important for everyone to know that because uh, we're with you. And so moving forward to continue that partnership, I think it's very important that you continue to reach out. So if there's anything that we can do to help your family um, with the reopening of schools, please, I urge you to reach out to your school-based principal and you can always reach out to one of us. We're here to partner with you and to help you in any way we can. So thank you so much. We're glad you were able to join us today and we will inform the community in the next week or two about the leveled stream yards that we'll have to answer specific questions about pre-k through elementary and then middle school and high school thank you thank, thank you everybody you. have a great rest of the day all right and mustangs out